Here is one of the two videos I made just over two years ago which has been blocked due to copyright infringements. It's a little odd because there are several clips in this video which could have been flagged um, and caused it to be blocked but uh, it was just one at the end so I've edited it, whittled it down a bit and um, it's about plate tectonics and here it is. Uh, I don't think the continents have moved much. I mean, they're moving a little bit with the continental drift. I understand that, earthquakes. and uh, But I don't think they were ever all together as one continent. You know, atheists have often said, or one guy asked in a seminar, Stop right there. What's this atheist thing? Plate tectonics and geology are not synonymous with atheism. Millions of people who understand and accept the theory of plate tectonics are believers. There are also millions who are non-believers. There is no dividing line, as Mr. Hovind implies, whereby everyone who accepts plate tectonics is an atheist. Brother Hovind, do you think you know the continents were ever connected? I say, well, they're still connected right now. <laughs> they're always connected, you know. It's just the low places are full of water. You know, hello, it's not like lily pads floating around in a bathtub. They, of course they're connected. Drain the water out of the oceans, and I don't know where you'd put it, but find a place to put it, and the whole Earth is connected. So yes, the continents may be moving some, but it, it's, that doesn't mean they were, you know, Africa and South America fit. So what? My house and the neighbor's house would fit too if you took the street out of the way. So it doesn't prove they were, they used to be connected. It's just that the shape is pure coincidence. The whole point of plate tectonics is that sections of the Earth's crust are floating on the mantle, which is composed of silicate rock. It may be hard to get your head around, Mr. Hovind, but granite, one of the major components of the continents, is lighter than the underlying mantle. This floating and drifting happens very slowly, but it is measurable. The speed is very similar to the rate at which our fingernails grow. Thanks to seismic records of earthquakes all around the world, we know that the Earth has a hot but solid iron and nickel core surrounded by a molten core which gives us our magnetosphere, which helps prevent solar storms from blowing our atmosphere away. The core is surrounded by layers of mantle, which are hot, but apart from areas of less dense lava, are what we would recognize as solid. But they act as a liquid, moving very slowly. Think of glaciers. They are made of solid ice, which you can climb on and break off in chunks with a hammer. But we know that they flow, like rivers, at a speed of a meter or more per day. The Earth's mantle is a bit like this, but the movement is much slower, an inch or two per year. Convection currents cause the ocean floors to spread and continental plates to drift in specific and measurable directions. I already mentioned that the continental crust is lighter than the mantle. The sea floor, which forms at the mid-oceanic ridges, is mainly basalt, which is heavier than granite. As the sea floor slowly spreads, it is subducted in many places where it collides with the continents. The heavier sea floor is pushed under the continents and is reabsorbed into the mantle. This is happening all around the Pacific Ocean, where we have what is known as the Ring of Fire, a series of volcanoes and earthquake-prone areas. As the sea floor, which contains water and accumulated sediments such as limestone, sinks into the hot mantle, Pockets of less dense lava form and often find their way to the surface in the form of volcanoes. Thus we have a source for new crust material. Since the discovery of radiometric dating we have been able to figure out that most of the sea floor is less than a hundred million years old, whereas parts of the continents are up to four billion years old. Contrary to what Mr. Hovind thinks, the shape of Africa and South America do match very closely. But not only that, look at the shape of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It also matches the shape of the coastlines. And not only that, the geology of both coastlines, as well as the fossils found in them, are the same, indicating that they were once joined together. How long ago were they joined, you might wonder? Well, we have at least two independent ways of figuring this out. One is the rate at which the sea floor is spreading, which I already mentioned is comparable to the rate at which our fingernails grow. Since the South Atlantic is about 2,000 miles across, 
we can calculate that it must have started to spread about 100 million years ago. The second way to figure out how old it is is by radiometrically dating the basalt on the seafloor. The results consistently show that the rock gets progressively older as you move away from the mid-oceanic ridge and towards the coastlines. The dates we get from these results match the estimates we get from the rate at which we observe them to be moving now, which strongly suggests that the movement did not speed up or slow down significantly in the past. So from this and other data, we can figure out what the Earth must have looked like in the past. The theory of plate tectonics explains why the coastlines of Africa and South America are so similar, and it explains the similarity of fossils and geology. It also explains how mountain ranges are formed as continental plates collide, and how volcanoes and earthquakes are the result of subduction zones. But Mr. Hoven sees it differently. I think if you're willing to look at it from a flood perspective, all of the geology of the oceans and the continents makes a whole lot more sense. And we cover that in video six. Mr. Hoven seems to think that his interpretation of the story of Noah's flood in Genesis has better explanatory power than geology and plate tectonics. As I've mentioned before, I think that the young earth doctrine is at the core of the problem. You don't have to be a young earther to be a Christian. Yet Hovind and others like him will tell you that it's vitally important. So here's another way we can tell that the Earth is at least millions of years old. Have a look at the islands of Hawaii. Here's what they look like from the International Space Station. Here they are on a map. What do they look like if we take the sea away? That's interesting. It looks like a line of mountains running from the southeast to the northwest with only the highest peaks poking above the water. Given what we understand about seafloor spreading, is it moving here, and if so, in what direction? It turns out that the seafloor is moving. Hawaii sits on a plate which is moving slowly towards the northwest. Underneath the southeastern end of this chain of islands and underwater mountains is a mantle plume. That is, a hot spot which remains in the same place as the oceanic crusts move above it. When we carry out radiometric dating tests on the rocks of the Hawaiian Islands, we find that they get progressively older towards the northwest, as well as less volcanically active. To the southeast of the main island, a new mountain is forming, underwater, which is estimated to breach the surface and form a new island in the chain in about a quarter of a million years from now. The radiometrically acquired dates match with the measured rate of tectonic plate movement, not only confirming our understanding of plate tectonics, but that this process has been going on for several million years. Before I finish, I would like to make one more observation about Mr. Hovind. I debated Michael Shermer uh, three times total. He's a very nice guy, very intelligent guy, and silly what he believes about, you know, <laughs> evolution theory. It's amazing. He's skeptical, Skeptic Magazine, skeptical of uh, UFOs, which he should be, and skeptical of aliens, which he should be, but he's not skeptical of the idea that he came from a rock. Saying that Michael Shermer believes he came from a rock is supposed to sound daft to those who have no clue what the theory of evolution really is. Evolution deals with the diversity of life and biological descent with modification, not the origin of life. The materials in rock can be incorporated into life forms, but to say we came from them makes very little sense. He doesn't apply his logical thinking on skepticism to his own religion of evolution, and I told him so. I'm sure he was delighted to hear that. The fact that evolution is not a religion is obvious to anyone who bothers to learn about it from those who study the subject rather than solely from those who criticize it from a young earth creationist point of view. Also, when it comes to selective skepticism, why won't Mr. Hovind apply that skepticism to the Bible? I submit that it's because he is doctrinally bound to the notion that it is the inerrant and infallible Word of God, and, in his mind, that's the one thing you can't apply critical thinking to. So much for scholarly and scientific impartiality. 
In my opinion, the proponents of young earth creationism are a lot like politicians, lawyers and used car salesmen, and nothing like scholars or scientists. It's all about making a case, or sale, before or instead of checking to see if the case is watertight. Thank you.